and welcome to the Center for Public Health Preparedness Grand Round Series. I'm Chris Smith, and I'll be your moderator today. Our guest today is Carrie Shear, social media and communication specialist who served with the Sacramento, Sacramento County Public Health Division in California. I've actually uh, known Carrie for a couple of years now. And Indeed, it's been a while. I have to say, as a technophobe, <laughs> uh, you just, you never cease to amaze me. You really are an expert in this subject. Well, you can do this. We can, we can pull you along, so you will be just like the geek next door. I hope so. Um, <laughs> what are we going to cover today? We're going to talk about uh, a number of different things, including why new media techniques need to be a part of, uh, really, the communications toolkit. We want to be able to help people communicate important health messages to the public every day during emergencies. I'm going to review a little bit about how Sacramento County got started in uh, new media and the use of that at Sacramento County Public Health how we used it during emergencies, including H1N1, and I'm even give you, gonna give you a little tour of our web studio. I wanna show you what we were able to shoehorn into a very small area, and uh, um, how others can get started doing that. It's really not that hard. You know, Carrie, I notice even the networks now, or the local television stations, seem to be using new media. They incorporate into their older technology. How yeah. can we put that to our advantage? Well, you know, we've tried that out, and uh, not just during emergencies, but just for fun in some other events. Let me show you an example of what we did with our local Fox affiliate. Uh, to promote seasonal flu shots. Now this was before H1N1 broke out, about a year before that, but we uh, created this little clip and found it can be an effective way to really show how you can use these techniques to communicate your message. Let's look at the video. Uh, let's go to Anna Lee, who's, hey, there's somebody else that's often behind the cameras, but sometimes in front. She's hanging out in the control room. What do you got for us here, Anna Lee? Well, guys, we've been getting in tons of emails and comments, but we have one dedicated viewer who actually sent in a video comment. So I'm playing that right now. It's a okay. great one. So keep your eyes on this, Paul. Good morning, Paul, to you and Rosemary and Natalie. This is Carrie Shearer in the communications office at Sacramento County Public Health. And I just want to say hello and congratulations on the second morning of your exciting new morning show. Now, I also want to remind you, though, that you need to get your flu shot this fall because with a new show, you cannot afford to be sick. But if you do get sick, I'm going to send you and the crew these amazing official digital thermometers like that. from we Sacramento County He's Public clever. Health. Now, Paul, just so there's no confusion, this is the kind that goes in your mouth. <laughs> Have a great show. Oh, uh, I like perfect. him. He should be a regular on Very our show. Sure. There seem to be a lot of interchangeable terms. I've heard social networking, mm -hmm. new media, social marketing. Can you explain what is new media? Well, new media, really, there are a number of different definitions, but it's really a term that encompasses the emergence and the convergence of all sorts of different technologies from computer to video to audio, all of that working together and um, helping you to communicate your message. So that's, that's really what it is. It's, it's networked information technologies and they're all working together and interconnected as we've seen with many of the uh, social media techniques today. You know, I imagine that many of our viewers will want to at least dip their toes into new media after right. viewing this broadcast, but before you take the plunge, what do you need to know about how people get their information? Well, it's really changed, as you know, and you've been in the news business and uh, have seen how it has changed over the years, and it really has now. We're not seeing the same numbers of people getting their information from traditional evening news broadcasts and um, network news broadcasts and things like they used to. As a matter of fact, we've got some statistics here that 59% uh, of Americans watch local news, and that's way down from where it used to be a few years ago. Only 23% of people under age 30 read newspapers. And Chris, is that any surprise when we see what's happening with the newspaper industry? and they're having to cut back, they're having to uh, scale back. Papers have folded, papers have merged. So we're seeing less actual reading of newspapers. A lot of the public, a lot more of the public is going online to get their news right now, 29% of the public. 
26% of Americans getting their news via cell phone now. And that's via the uh, Pew uh, research study from a little bit earlier in 2010. So the cell phone really is a way to be able to keep on top of the news during the day. And that's what is happening. 73% of Americans are following the news during the course of the day. And that's up from 61% just a couple of years ago. So it's no longer we're waiting for the 5 o'clock or 6 o'clock newscast. We're getting it all day long on our cell phone or our other connected device. But the good news is that health news has always right up there at the top. It's tied for third place, really, as one of the main interests of, of news for consumers. And, of course, that's good for those of us in public health who are trying to communicate about uh, important health issues and the flu and pertussis and MRSA and all of the things that are out there because we know that those are stories that newsrooms are looking for. Oh, absolutely, you know, because they can always localize them, right. find someone to whom it occurred in their local viewing area. Internet use, though, it seems like everybody's online. My father's online. Well, that's good to hear. <laughs> My mom is online, too. I'm proud of her. And, uh, and a lot of people are connected. They're, the technology isn't as scary or bulky as it was a few years ago because, you know, we can all remember, for those of us who were around when PCs began to become available, it was difficult to get them configured and you'd plug in a new peripheral or something like that and it would be difficult to get it to work. But now there are more and more people who are online. In fact, 75% of adults are online. Average house containing two computers. Of course, that's not our house. We've got like, I don't know, five perhaps. Uh, many users are, are going to video sharing sites and almost half, and that's probably even up. I mean, it just keeps climbing. 15% of those yesterday, according to the Pew study. So people are going online, they're going to YouTube, Vimeo, a lot of the different sharing sites to be able to get videos. And of course, YouTube is one way to use video to help deliver important public health messages. That's kind of how we got started at Sacramento County Public Health Division. We were actually in my office yesterday talking about how you could use video mm -hmm. to help people in emergencies. For yeah. instance, if you tell people they need to disinfect their water and put several drops of chlorine bleach in their water, what does a drop constitute? Wouldn't it be far exactly. easier to demonstrate? Kind of show. It. Well, exactly. And people learn in different ways. You know, some people, they've got to have the printed page. Uh, other people really need to see it. And nothing shows that better than video. And it's very easy to do a quick video. In fact, a little bit later on in the show, we are going to show you some of the different tools and techniques that you can use to be able to create your own videos and and uh, put those online very quickly, which is great in emergencies especially. Is there a cost to that? Uh, well, a little bit of cost to buying the equipment, mm -hmm. but uh, you know what's happening now out there, really everybody is a reporter. Big media is in total flux. What's happening right now is that um, local and uh, community news seems to have some stability, but a lot of stations are having to downsize they're going to one-person reporter crews, as you see in the picture there. Uh, there's a lot of eye reporters uh, and actually one-man bands out there, one-person videographers. So where in a traditional situation, particularly a large market like New York in the past, you may have had a videographer, uh, a reporter, and an audio person, and maybe even a field producer on a story. Now, many stations, and I know this is happening in Sacramento, are hiring one person who can do it all. So that means they need to be able to go out and shoot the story, report the story, handle the audio, handle the video, and then edit it, in many cases, on a laptop and uh, get it on the air at the station. So they need to be able to do all of that themselves. So there's a lot of pressure on, on reporters. And also now, Everybody's a reporter. Yes. We've all got, do you have a smartphone? I don't have a smartphone, but my cell phone will take video. Exactly. That's what's happening because we have people being able to shoot video and upload it instantly. And so really, everybody's a reporter. And I know that causes uh, some consternation because maybe they don't have the same journalistic uh, background, of course, and, and credentials and, uh, and all. But yet this video is being used on the air. It's being put on the air. So really... That's something that, as communicators in the public health area, we need to be aware of that our information can go national very, very quickly. And it also seems to me that people are seeking out more than one source of information. Yeah. So you need to be 
one of the sources that they seek out. Yes, that is an excellent point because uh, the expectations are changing now. With In the past, we used to say, you know, we're the experts. We're the health experts. Here is what you must do. But right now, that's kind of changing with the Internet. What's happening is there's a lot of information out there. And it's more of a horizontal model now instead of the, the you know, the top-down model. So let's say uh, on the issue of should I have my child vaccinated, people will go to the Internet. And I did this. I went to YouTube. I put the word vaccinations in there, and I came up with a slew of of uh, videos on YouTube that were anti-vaccination and uh, downright uh, untrue in a lot of the information they contained. So what happens if you're not there as a public health agency with your message? Uh, you need to be out there in the mix. So and, and realize that people are going to go to the internet, they're going to look at all the sources out there, and then they're going to make their own decisions. So that's what's changed a bit. Uh, social media is being more trusted these days. It's becoming more influential, and again, for agencies, my word is that if, if you're not currently involved in these techniques, you need to learn about them now and get involved because it's the direction things are going and it's where people are now looking for information, and particularly health information, which as we saw earlier, is very high in people's minds. And I think what we need to do is combine the best of both kind of the vertical top down and the horizontal to be able to get our messages out there and have an impact with the public. And that means social media as, uh, as well. You know, I think you just made an excellent point because we're all excited about social media, yes. new media. It's the new thing. It's bells. It's whistles. It's, it's kind of cool. But it can't be the only thing. It's an adjunct to what we've been doing all along. Yeah, that's true. We still need to maintain our traditional approaches. But as we've seen with viewership in TV news and all, um, and TV programs in general, it has, it's gone down because the audience has become more fragmented. So we need to be out there in, in all these different venues. Uh, the number and diversity of sources and channels, it's going to continue to multiply. We know that that's happening. And that means it is harder to get our message out to, this, to the right person because we're trying to target uh, various groups that we're trying to reach with our health messages. But it's, you know, it's difficult. It's a challenge. So it is important to combine all of those approaches and have our best outreach efforts yep. underway. And I think health consumers want to take some of this decision making into their own hands. They want to feel empowered. Yeah, that's right. This really does empower them. This, this, um, gives them really the power to go and find the information that they're looking for to make informed decisions hopefully based on accurate information and I feel that it is absolutely critical to make this information available to people in the way that they want to receive it. We know that many people, and you'll see you know, many younger demographics, extremely connected throughout the day. This is with smartphones, this is with the internet, this is with uh, things like uh, portable PDAs and iPads and uh, all sorts of different connected devices. And it's more important than ever to be able to reach them with our messages in the way that they want to receive them. True story, my grandkids and their parents are staying with us this summer and every one of them has a computer. And they talk to each other through Facebook. Yeah. One will be in one room and another will be in another <laughs> room. That and they'll pop up on Facebook. It's, exactly. It's, 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 it's the way of the world. We really have to, you know, get in line with it. It's really important. That's so right. Maybe take us through some of these new media options. Yeah. Let me show you some of the things that we've used at Sacramento County Public Health to be able to um, communicate better with those in the Sacramento region. One of them, of course, you'll be familiar with probably is Twitter, twitter.com. For those who aren't familiar, though, it is a microblog. It lets you stay in touch um, using the web, and it sends, you send short messages on that. It's one, actually 140 character messages out to people who subscribe. So these 140 character messages go out to those who are following you on your page. And then as well, you can follow other people on your Twitter page. Um, for instance, at Sacramento County Public Health, we follow the Centers for Disease Control, and we get all of their updates so we can look there and you know when we see something then we'll take it and we'll turn it around and retweet it that means you send it out again and that's part of the power of Twitter on all of this because you can 
resend messages out to others and 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 others continue to send those along and it really makes a big difference. Let's take a look at uh, another uh, area right now which is actually um, oh this is an example here for those in the New York area very very familiar when the plane went down in the Hudson. Yes. How did you hear about that first Chris? Do you recall? Uh, it was breaking news. It was breaking news and you know one of the ways that the news was broken was on Twitter. There were people on the ferry and this is actually the, the tweet that went out there that there's a plane in the Hudson, I'm on the ferry, I'm going to pick up people, crazy. This is one of the first announcements of it. So Twitter is actually a place where breaking news happens and it can be extremely useful for um, those who are following the news and sending information out. Here's what our Twitter page looks like uh, at Sacramento County and this is just an example. I pulled this up from actually uh, October of 2009 during the H1N1 pandemic. So we saw here uh, there's a reference to myths and facts about the flu, there's supply status links, there's information on new interim guidance on H1N1 infection control from the CDC. Those are the kinds of things you might send out as a health agency. When you have a news conference nowadays, you're never sure who in the room really is a journalist and who's a blogger. A lot right. of blogging going on. Right, that's right. And uh, Blogger, um, Blogspot, WordPress, those are all different free blogging tools that you can take advantage of. And they're very, very handy. We're not currently using this at Sacramento County Public Health because, of course, doing a blog does take an investment of time. You need somebody um, who is interested in, can, in writing regular pieces. You don't have to write every day, maybe two, three times uh, a week would be fine. But to get information out on a blog, but there are many tools out there, they're free, and it's great to keep colleagues and constituents and those who are interested in your messages informed about what's going on in your agency. I would imagine, though, if you're going to do a blog, you've got to monitor it. You've got yes. to make sure it's updated. You've got exactly. to monitor the comments, respond to the comments. With any of social media, that's the key, Chris, because it's got to be personal. You need to have... Um, if you can possibly have a face behind it, have a real person behind it, the text, the blogs, the tweets, they need to sound personal and be personal because that's what social media is all about. It's about interaction. I spoke about Facebook. Um, I'm on Facebook, believe it or not. Well, I'm going to send you a friend request. <laughs> I will friend you. Right. I will friend you. And I'm finding people that I haven't seen in years. Yeah. And uh, we, our department actually used Facebook to spread the word, not the virus. Um, and I did monitor, and when I saw some things I thought should be responded to, I responded to yeah. them nicely, but, you know, just to, to make the point. So Facebook is pretty popular now, isn't it? It is. You know, it started off really for college students and then adults and boomers and everybody else really, really glommed on to Facebook, and it has exploded. In fact, uh, during July of 2010, it reached 500 million users. So that is just incredible the way Facebook has exploded. And of course, in the meantime, what's happened is companies have found out that, hey, Facebook is a good place for us to make what are called fan pages. And the way that works is you sign up as a regular personal Facebook user and then create a fan page for your business and your administrator of that fan page. So what we've done at Sacramento County Public Health Division is created a fan page for the health division. And we take content that we send out by Twitter and we send out by some of our other means and we put it on Facebook. And the good thing about Facebook is you can also upload videos. So you can post your videos there. You can post um, still pictures as well. If you go out and have an event, uh, we will always take a camera or um, a still camera or video camera out to our events and record pictures and still images of the event and then have those available. We'll put some, you know, some of the better ones on uh, Facebook and of course any videos that we produce. So it's a good way to get out there. It goes out to our friends and our friends see it on their, their what's called their uh, news feed. Mm -hmm. And then if there's good information there, they can uh, resend that out to others. And so Facebook is a great wall. place. Yeah, great place to, to stay connected with others. You know what would be interesting if we were to have a news conference, for instance, and to somehow 
um, get it live at, at the moment. You can control the content. Is right. there a way to do that? Yeah, there is. There is. And uh, going live with uh, with an event, it's called uh, it's called UStream. You know, while we're on the topic of social media, I want to I wanted to mention something that I know is is coming up and, and really integrating social media, which is something that the Discovery Channel is doing. It's interesting; they're doing um, a show on how a pandemic could actually affect you. And I came across really just before our broadcast here, I came across uh, kind of a screenshot, and and they actually have an interface where you can go in and it will pull your friends into this screenshot. I don't know if you can see that great on the right side of the screen, but um, it pulls your social media contacts in and shows what kind of conversations might be going on if there were to be uh, a pandemic out there. It's a very uh, uh, realistic simulation, and we can only imagine if we had something you know far worse than what we've dealt with with H1N1 where um, there were uh, serious deaths and serious impacts, a BT event or something in a major city, how social media would come into play. It's really critical, particularly in emergency preparedness, to understand how these tools work and to, uh, to be able to use them. And part of that is really what you said, being able to, to take like a news event, a news conference, and go live with that on the internet. Um, so. It's called Ustream TV. That's one of the sources that we use. It's live streaming audio and video with viewer text chat capability. What that means is you can take using a laptop computer and plug in a video camera. I brought along, uh, this is one of the video cameras that we use. This is uh, just a small digital video camera. But you can actually take this and plug it into your laptop computer and use a camera like this to webcast your news event over a service called Ustream. Now you can use it, of course, for non-emergencies. You can use it for uh, public meetings and other kinds of events like that. How's but the audio with that, Carrie? The audio, uh, the audio can be good. What you want to do is use an external microphone uh, plugged into either the camcorder or a special port on the laptop rather than the built-in uh, microphone on the laptop, which is not generally of high quality. You want to have the microphone close to the person who's doing the talking. But uh, something like Ustream really allows you to uh, put the information out there, do it live, and it's a great thing to experiment with. And you know, Chris, with any of these tools, a great way to get started is to experiment personally um, with uh, your own um, you know, family material and things like that, and then figure out how can I integrate this into the office environment after I get familiar with it. So that's one way to get started. I understand that your public health division actually used or produced audio cuts for um, yes. during the H1N1 pandemic. That's right. We've, we've done uh, ready-to-use audio cuts, and, and not just during the pandemic emergency, but also just as a matter of course. What we've seen in the media business is radio stations have consolidated, and they've gone to uh, smaller staffs, more stations uh, in one location. So what we do is we pre-produce audio cuts and provide them to local radio newsrooms. Well, how do we do that? We actually go to the newsmaker, uh, which let's say it's our immunization assistance program coordinator who's running a seasonal flu program and we'll go to that person and interview them just as if we were a reporter and we'll use a device like this this unit is a digital audio recorder and the digital audio recorder is uh, on a device that records to an SD card so I'm gonna flip this over and just show you right in the bottom pop this out here and I'll pull that out so here's the SD card right here. This is a standard SD card of the type that you might have on a digital um, camera? still camera. Yeah, mm -hmm. digital still camera. And you'll record the audio. It'll go onto that. And then you'll just put that in your computer. And what we'll do is we'll take an audio cut. We'll, we'll ask several questions. We'll trim it down to the length that would typically be used in a radio news broadcast, which could be anywhere from 15 to 30 seconds. And then we'll put that on our website on the internet. So it's a really good way to get your message out. We'll take maybe a news release, write a news release around it, and then send that to the radio station and send them the link to the audio cuts. And 
even in our market, we've had high success rate with the use of these. And I think that with the smaller staffs, the larger stations, there is more need for this kind of uh, audio. Also, again, you get your message and it's formulated the way that you think it's, you know, most appropriate. It's exactly. not edited, you know, so I think that's good. Uh, Carrie and I actually had a brief conversation before the program because I, as you know, am a uh, neophyte at this. Huh. And one of the websites you mentioned, uh, it's got the favorite name of all, SmugMug.com. SmugMug. It's just one. What is that? Well, it's one <laughs> of a number of photo sharing sites. And you know, there's Flickr, there's others out there that people are using. We use one called SmugMug. And what happens is when we go to an event, let's say we have a health fair in the community, we'll take pictures of that, we'll take video of that, we'll load the still pictures to our online SmugMug photo sharing site. And that gives you a little, on the right side of the screen, that gives you a little idea of what the, uh, some of the galleries are. So for example, we'll have portraits there of our uh, key staff who might maybe uh, need to have a photo for a, a bio or for a newspaper article. We'll have uh, pictures of emergency preparedness activities and news interviews and other things that we've done. And it's available in full quality online. What that does for me as a communications person is it means I don't have to go searching my hard drive to find the photos. They're well organized. They're online. If I get a, uh, a call while I'm here in the Albany area from somebody in Sacramento saying that they need a photo of our health officer, I can go find the link, send them the link to that, and they can download the full quality photo. So I've just really found that to be an organizational tool where you can keep your photos organized and ready to use whenever you might need them. And that's higher quality than might be on your internet site? Yeah, there are some photo sharing sites where you upload your, your picture, and let's say some of the better cameras are taking 10, mega, uh, 10 megabyte size photos these days, some even more, of course. but those are huge file sizes and some photo sharing sites won't let you put the original full quality on there. This does, so we know that it's just as it appeared from the camera. You know, we touched on this briefly, but I think it's important, so could you go into a little greater detail about how uh, TV stations and networks are, are doing their own social marketing chats, things like that? Right, yeah, there is a, there is a lot of um, variability out there right now. I know one of the stations in the Sacramento market uh, is doing a thing that they call live online. I've got a picture that I brought along of it here that uh, kind of shows what the set is like in the lower right hand corner. That's uh, really a web set that they've made in their newsroom and we've got a couple of our health educators there talking about HIV testing. But some stations in some markets actually they'll do live chats online on the TV station uh, website and then they'll do cut-ins during the regular news broadcasts where the anchor of the web chat will say hi you know we're live online with Sacramento County Public Health right now we're talking about HIV testing join us online at our web address and you can chat in questions and our experts are here with the answers so if you're in communications that's a great way to kind of look out and see what is happening um, and uh, be able to get your information across to a dedicated online audience who really wants the information. It's, it's a great way that some stations have chosen to kind of get people to the web and integrate it with their news broadcasts. Regular viewers of this broadcast have heard me say this before, but perception is reality. And yes. I understand that you had a perception issue mm -hmm. dealing with a MRSA outbreak, a methicillin Resistance, Resistance Staphylococcus aureus, yes, yeah. MRSA from now on, or MRSA. <laughs> MRSA. <laughs> That's much easier to say. And you actually used uh, social media to yes. handle that, correct? This was really the first time for us at Sacramento County Public Health where we started to use social media. We had an MRSA uh, event, uh, actually a news release that came out from a completely different state. And what happened was local stations, they always what? Try to localize the news. And so they were checking around. They found out that a school or two had a student with MRSA reported. And that really turned into kind of an overhyped concern about MRSA. And we went into a period of really several weeks where people were overreacting, schools were, were having every square inch of Formica desk surface 
scrubbed down by teams of white-suited janitors. Parents were concerned. There was a lot of news media coverage. It was really overemphasized. So we ended up creating a YouTube video uh, ourselves to kind of explain the issue using uh, then at the time our deputy health officer and we got the information out uh, to schools and thus to parents. So that's one of the benefits to using these social media techniques. We're not saying we don't love our media partners because we do, but they've got time constraints. So what this does, it allows you to take your message unfiltered, uncut, and get directly to, in this case, parents with information about what the true facts are about MRSA. Well, for those of us who aren't as hands-on, when you upload a YouTube video, I mean, there's video code issues. I don't even know what this means. Could you talk about that? Yeah, <laughs> it, it's uh, it's not too difficult. It does take a little bit of getting used to. This is our uh, MRSA video here, but you can see that this is what it looked like on our YouTube channel. When you go to YouTube.com, it takes just a few moments to register and create a channel for yourself. And so that's what we did in this case. It took about five, six minutes to create our YouTube channel. We uploaded our video. I'm going to change to the next slide right now and show you what the embedded video code looks like. And what does that mean? What that means is if you look, next time you go to YouTube and play a video, right under the video, there is a place where you can share the video. And you can either select the code. There's actually a line of code, which is the address of where the video is on YouTube. And you can paste that into an email and send it to somebody. That's called a link. Say, hey, click on this link, watch our video. Or there's an embed code. It's a little longer line of code. You copy that with your mouse cursor. And then if you're the administrator of your web page, you can go on to the page that you want this video to appear on in the uh, what's called the HTML view. And you can paste that code in and magically on your page, up will pop the video player. So that's what we did on this to get the video player or the video player embedded on our website. And so it's it's a great way to really share your videos using the resources of YouTube. We had a conversation with college students following H1N1 because obviously they were a priority group and uh, we did a focus group and, and very few of them actually had gotten vaccinated and one of the things they referenced was a YouTube video mm -hmm. of a college-age cheerleader I believe yes. that allegedly had uh, a neurologic condition as a result of getting the H1N1 vaccine. Right. Later I, I researched that and neurologists were saying um, she, those symptoms, you know, were not commensurate with what she said she had and it turned out she never even got H1 vaccine, H1N1, she got seasonal vaccine, but yes. to a person they said they saw that and they decided not to get it. Now, if that could have encountered in real time, that would have perhaps made a difference. That would have helped a lot because I saw that video as well and I know there were, people are concerned about it. It, it. It's like you have to be wary with what's on the internet. You need to look at what is the source of this information? What credibility and track record does that information source have when it comes to this video? Um, when you actually take a video that might counter something like that and embed it on the page, this is what it looked like on our H1, or pardon me, on our regular website for Sacramento County Public Health. That's the MRSA video. And that's when you use that right. embedded code. Exactly. Okay. And then right here, this is our public health homepage. And you can see in the upper right hand corner there, that's where you'd click to get that video. So it's, it's not too difficult. And if you're, you don't have administrator rights yourself to your website to make changes, you can get somebody from IT uh, to do this. I will say it is really important for public health programs and communications programs specifically to have a great relationship with their IT department and have the understanding that these are tools. What I've found in talking with my colleagues, many times uh, management doesn't understand the importance of these tools and IT blocks the sites. So the communications people who need to understand how these tools work and what they are can't even get to the site to view what they need to view to do their job and, and uh, prepare for the future. So it's really important, I think, that, uh, that IT departments and management uh, open the gates, uh, the blockage gates to these tools for communications programs. Especially as become more and more prominent in their use. When I think of California and emergencies, I think of wildfires. Yes. 
did you have any situation where you needed to use this new media in, in the wild? Did you have wildfires? We sure you? did. You know, one of the first areas where I heard about uh, the use of uh, Twitter in an emergency was actually down in Southern California, San Diego fires. They were uh, evacuating neighborhood after neighborhood. There was a local radio station down there that started using Twitter to send out advisories that they would get from their listeners saying, okay, this street is being evacuated, this roadway is closed. And within a matter of days, they had, I think it was something like 5,000 or more people who were following their feed. And as a result, they were getting information out faster than the authorities were. And again, this is kind of just a warning because what's going to happen in an emergency is the media and the regular public are going to be able to communicate faster than we are as communicators if we're not using these tools and if we don't have some things staged and ready to go. So that's what was happening. And now, as well as safety issues, wildfires cause yes. public health concerns. Oh, smoke, exactly. Smoke problems. Yeah, and, and we had a huge problem during the summer of 2008 during this, in the Sacramento area. We had major wildfires burning north of the Sacramento area sending smoke down the down the valley these were lightning sparked fires that that broke out it just filled the area with smoke and air monitors were showing really really high levels of fine particles as we know those can get into the lungs cause all sorts of problems and there was uh, public concern over the health effects of the bad air quality so it was a, a bad situation what we did in response to that is we worked with the local air quality management district and developed some smoke health statements. We embedded the air quality index forecast bug on our homepage. That's in the upper right hand corner and that is something you could do right now with your websites. It's supplied by the US EPA at uh, EPA's airnow.gov website. So you can download the specific air quality forecast bug for your area. We put that on our homepage and then created a breaking news, news page on our website covering the smoke issue and of course made the health officer Dr. Glenna Troche available for news interviews on that but we did one thing more we created a video specifically to address the issues a short four minute video which acknowledged the smoke situation and giving the health impacts and precautions we put that on our breaking news page with a YouTube player that we embedded as I showed you a moment ago we put it on the Air Quality Management District SpareTheAir.com site, which was really, really heavily trafficked, of course, much more than, than our public health site. And then we put it on the Sacramento County website. Was I, it well received? It was very well received. We had uh, a very high viewership of that, particularly having it in more than one place on the Air District's website, 2,000 views in about two and a half days or so and a feature story on our local CBS affiliate. They didn't even actually come talk to us. They took our video off there. They went and used some cut out, some B-roll shots of all the smoke in the area. The reporter did a stand-up just outside, so a, a story appeared without us even really being part of it. But it gave very high visibility to the Air Quality Management District and public health working together to get their information out. And, you know, in, in all too many instances during emergencies, we see competing agency goals and priorities. So this was a great example, I think, of working together. Now, you'd think that after that week of smoke, that would be it, right? Uh, no. No, because <laughs> the smoke, did that happen on a Friday afternoon, by the way? Oh, I'm trying to remember. I think it started, it actually started on a Sunday, and then as the week went along, it started, it started to clear out somewhat. We had some breezes which basically changed the direction of the smoke. Well, in New York there seems to be a rule that if it's bad it has to happen on a Friday afternoon, you know, yeah. usually about four o'clock. But, but so that's why I don't think that this was probably the end of it. No, no. As Tell a matter of more. fact, it, we had like a respite of three or f maybe three, four days or oh, so. you're golden. And then it was back. <laughs> it was back again with a vengeance the next week. It was back. The wildfires, of course, were still burning. They were very difficult to put out. The wind patterns, again, filled the region with smoke. We had just particle levels that were going crazy in some areas of Northern California. But a new threat, we were hit by a heat wave. We know what it's like when it gets hot here. Now, we don't have the humidity in California that we do in, uh, in uh, uh, say, the Northeast or Midwest. But we had temperatures as high as 107 degrees. Oh, my goodness. And you know what that does for public health concern. 
seniors and shut-ins and people right. without air conditioning. So we not only had a message to communicate about the smoke and the impacts of the smoke, we had another message to communicate about uh, staying hydrated and protecting yourself in the uh, high heat wave that was coming. So we were really back into it for almost another week again. And what we did is pretty much the same thing we did the first time around. We created a video and put that on our website. And um, as a matter of fact, I've got some pictures here of the kind of the smoke data. You can see just what that looked like and what the air quality data looked like on the right-hand uh, side of your screen there. The purple, that, believe me, is not good. That is hazardous no. conditions. And so we did everything we did before, plus we activated a heat wave page. We made a new web page. We developed a new four-minute video in just a matter of hours, again, this was on a Monday afternoon, covering not only the smoke and the ozone air pollution, but now the heat part of it in there as well. And then we put that on our two pages, once again on Air District Spare the Air .com site and the county website. AQMD, any idea how many hits they were getting on their website during this period of time? Mm, 2,000 a day? Uh, it was it was a million hits a day. Oh, my goodness. They almost did it crash it? <laughs> it actually did. They had to disable some of the features on the website because they were getting so many hits. So that was sure the place to be with our, uh, with our, with our video and uh, a great way to get the word out. What I want to do right now is let's take a look at a portion of what that video looked like. And what I want to caution you here is this is not a highly po uh, polished production. We do own a tripod. We actually did it kind of the, the cheap, shaky YouTube way just to show that, hey, this is something that we turned around in just a matter of a couple of hours. And it's something that you too can do. And a little bit later, we're going to show you how you can do this and what the tools are that you'll need. Let's take a look. This week, the Sacramento region is getting hit with a triple punch of smoke from wildfires, ozone air pollution, and a heat wave with temperatures over 100 degrees. First, the smoke. The problem with the smoke is the small particles that can get into your lungs. Anytime smoke settles into our region, it can be a health concern, according to Sacramento County Health Officer Dr. Glenna Troche. We've also been getting some questions about the dust masks that you can buy at the hardware store. Are they effective at all at filtering out particles? Dr. Trochet has the answer. Unfortunately, the particles in the air that cause the problems with the lungs can go through those dust masks, so they become more of a nuisance than a help. There are some uh, masks called respirators that if they're properly fitted around the face might decrease the particles. However, people who use these masks do have to be fitted for them and they need to have healthy lungs because it is, it is more difficult to breathe through them. The masks that can provide effective filtering are labeled NIOSH N95 or P100. If you have questions, Sacramento County Public Health is available to answer them. You can call us at area code 916-875-5881. And SpareTheAir.com is the one-stop location to get air quality forecasts, real-time conditions, or sign up for free air alert advisories sent to your cell phone or your email account. So you're pretty comfortable in that anchor role, it seems. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I enjoy it. I certainly yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. So, but but uh, other people can do this, you assure us. Absolutely. Any communications uh, person in a public agency, they're there because they are a communicator. And certainly with practice, you can do it. Good. Good. We'll, we'll trust you on that. Yeah. So the elephant in the room, of course, is H1N1. Yes. And if you didn't use social media tools during that, you never used them. So I'm assuming you used them. Yeah. Tell us how. Yeah, we certainly did. Of course, H1N1 was huge for all of us in public health, and uh, it really stretched everybody's resources. In the Sacramento area, we had... Um, quite an outpouring as people were waiting for the vaccine. And then we implemented 35 rotating H1N1 clinics. We went to a new site uh, almost every day or every couple of days. There's some pictures that you can see of our, uh, some of our first clinics there. And as we move along, we had widespread activity, uh, of course a continuous flu season since April of 2009, and Overall, in Sacramento County, 507 hospitalizations, 23 deaths. So we conducted these 35 H1N1 clinics using not only staff, but we relied very, very heavily on volunteers. And Chris, I brought along a video to give you a flavor 
of what it was like to go through this and then also how we integrated social media and new media techniques in our communications. Let's take a look. Sacramento County Public Health extensively used new media techniques to reach out. We created a new H1N1 website that could support streaming video and host all of our documents in multiple languages. We webcast news conferences and educated the public on what to expect when they came to a clinic. Real-time updates were issued to our growing group of Twitter followers, and updates were posted on our Facebook page. At a drive through clinic, we used an FM transmitter to inform and entertain motorists while they waited with a mixture of live and recorded material. Week after week throughout the fall and into the winter, H1N1 clinics continued at location after location. I'm assuming that you produced that video, Carrie. Yeah, we did that in-house, and really, this is something a communications person can do. It's not that tough. So I just want to encourage people to experiment with this. We actually put together a web studio in my small office that we use as a shooting location, and I brought along some video to kind of show you what it looks like. Hello, I'm Carrie Shearer in the Sacramento County Public Health Communications Office. Under the leadership of Sacramento County Public Health Officer Dr. Glenna Troche, Public Health has developed advanced communications capability that is unique in the county. I've gotten a number of requests for a brief overview of what we're doing, so here goes. The web studio in my office serves as home base for news interviews, video productions, and webcasts. Though I constructed the set out of a combination of raw materials and retail store cast-offs, it provides a professional on-air look for productions and interviews. Set lighting is supplied by e-studio fluorescent lights that keep room temperatures comfortable when shooting in the confined office space. TV news reporters, who are often now operating their own video cameras as well as reporting, appreciate knowing they don't have to worry about setting up lights and they're going to be shooting in an aesthetically pleasing environment. I use Adobe Premiere Pro and the full Adobe Creative Suite to edit our video productions, many of which have been short turnaround projects that have been placed on our website in a matter of hours. During the three months of H1N1 flu clinics from November 2009 through January 2010, I used video extensively to show residents what to expect when they came to one of our 35 clinics and provide them with regular clinic updates on the website. I sent approved B-roll video to television stations of our highly secure H1N1 vaccine inventory and distribution and placed news conferences right on the website live via streaming video on Ustream as well as recorded playback on our YouTube site. Our multi-camera capability allows for live webcasts and even Skype interviews live on local TV stations like this one direct from our studio. We use a digital audio recorder to produce ready-to-use sound bites that help us get our perspective across, particularly with the rapidly shrinking news staffs that radio stations are experiencing. With more and more people turning to the internet for their news, it's essential to have a robust web and social media presence for county communications. I regularly use Twitter to send out advisories and updates, and we actually had people come up and tell us they came to our clinics because they got a Twitter advisory. The added power in Twitter is the redistribution of messages from one recipient to another. Our Facebook page is yet another way for residents to connect with public health. At the H1N1 clinics, Dr. Trochet did dozens of interviews with Spanish media and distributed materials in many different languages. We went on the air at a drive through flu clinic with a low-power FM radio transmitter to keep motorists informed about wait times. It seems as if word has gotten around. Sacramento County Public Health has developed a national reputation for being on the cutting edge of effective communication. Invitations come in from state and national conferences to speak about our efforts and to provide advice to other agencies on how they can get started using these methods. Public health communications is way more than just dealing with the news media. That's only a small part of what I do. Communications is an integral part of all of our projects and outreach initiatives, our website, our social media presence, and our emergency, pandemic, and bioterror preparedness planning efforts. We've seen a few videos of you in your studio, but yeah. can you broadcast live from there? Yeah, as a matter of fact, you can. Using Skype, the internet service that's absolutely free that allows you to connect one-on-one -on -one and do a video chat. 
with uh, somebody. And in fact, more and more TV stations nowadays are getting set up with Skype so they can take incoming feeds. We even see it in network broadcasts. Even though the quality level isn't as good as we get from you know, a regular studio, it's still quite acceptable for a brief news interview. So we've actually done that with our local uh, Fox affiliate and it's worked out very, very well. So that's one of the uh, advantages to having a, a web studio. I would imagine, especially when your health director is handling an emergency, he or she can't be running around to every studio in the locality. So Exactly. And you can talk out of your jurisdiction, too, if you need to. Right. Yeah, it's, it's really, really handy. You simply, uh, you know, plug a microphone into your computer, plug your digital video camera into your computer, and then you dial in on a cell phone to the station's... Uh, they call it the IFB line, but really it's, it's where they have the audio for their anchors. Uh, so you can listen to the anchors using an earbud. It's a very simple system. What tools do we need if we're going? We are going to do this. We can yes, do this. Yes, you can do this. What tools do we need? Well, Chris, I brought along my tech toolbox of a few things to show you. Some of them are simple internet tools. Some of them are hardware. So let's take a look at a couple of these things right now. One of the things I always get, uh, people always get stuck on is I need to send a large file. How do I do that? It bounces back from somebody's email box. Well, this is a great system. It's called You Send It. It's free. YouSendIt.com. It allows you to send free files, large files, up to 100 gigabytes, uh, megabytes, I should say, 100 megabytes for free. There are other levels that let you send larger files that are paid levels, but that works most uh, for most videos that that you might send as uh, maybe a Windows Media video file or a typical internet video. It works very, very well. So that's YouSendIt.com. Let's take a look at another tool right now, and that is something we mentioned earlier. It's Ustream.tv, a free web service that allows you to connect to it. What I didn't mention earlier, though, is you can record your feed for later playback or embed the feed in your website. So that means if you webcast a news conference, you can send out the link to that later on for people who might have missed it. So we found that very useful, particularly during H1N1. And that's kind of what the Ustream interface uh, looks like right there. What we did as well is we used the CDC's tools. They've got a great social media department there, and they have all sorts of wonderful things, including the ability to embed their live news conferences, and that's what I've got in this graphic. It'll be hard to read, but it's got the embed code, which works just kind of like YouTube, where you copy the code, you paste that onto your page, and magically the CDC's player pops up. It is uh, a very good system and they offer you a lot of tools so I encourage you to check them out and implement them if you haven't already. All right, let's see what else we've got here. Embedding the Twitter feed on your website. This is an excellent thing to do because it makes you more flexible and efficient as a communicator. Let's say you need to do an update. You send your update to your Twitter page and you can set Twitter up and this is what it looks like here using a widget that is simply uh, some code that lets you place a graphic on your web page and so when you send your Twitter feed it will put that that message automatically on your web page without you having to log into your web page or do anything additional so it's really helpful let me show you an example here of what it looked like on our web page this is a shot of our Twitter feed on the left side so you can kind of see how our uh, Twitter feed looks there to find out about myths and facts about the flu. And then on the right side, that's how it looked embedded in our web page itself. So we embedded the latest three Twitter messages. So that's very, very useful. Makes you more efficient as a communicator where you just have to send your message to one place and it goes to a number of other places. Carrie, you d developed all these videos. Mm -hmm. And I believe you just told me that you used your computer to do that. Yeah, I actually did. I actually did use the computer to do that. And there's good, there's good software out there to be able to use the computer to create videos and to record and edit. Let me show you a couple of tools right now. Um, one of them is to do audio recording. Now, earlier we talked about how you can use a digital audio recorder to be able to record interviews, but how do you get that on your computer? Uh, you simply take the SD card out, put it on your computer, and you need an audio editing program. There's one there that you can get that is called uh, Audacity, and uh, it is a freebie, 
and we got the website there at audacity.sourceforge.net. Another way you can get audio into your computer is to use this little device. This is a microphone to USB converter. I'll show you the front panel there. So this will take a professional microphone right on the end. You can see the uh, it's called an XLR connector. So any professional microphone and you can then out the back end it sends out a USB signal. So you put your USB right in there and then put it into your computer. This has a number of things on it including um, the volume control and all of that. You can actually see your level. This makes this only a $99 device and it allows you to put high quality professional audio directly into your computer to be able to record it. So that's one way that you can record uh, those types of different uh, feeds well, and get, get them on that, the air. Where do you get that, Where would one purchase that? There are a number of different um, um, places that would sell a device like this. Of course, and, and then uh, there's mail order places, BH Photo Video is one that comes to mind in the New you York go area. On the internet and yeah, find you can go it. on the internet and you can find all those different uh, sources. So we've got another another thing that you can try out. It's this does cost money, but it's literally a TV studio on your computer. It's made by a company called Telestream. It's called Wirecast. And I've got an example there. The big window you see with the public health logo, that is your program. That's basically what is going out onto the internet. And these sources along the bottom can be anything. It can be live video cameras. The second image from the left on the bottom, that's what the webcam, the built-in webcam looks like on the laptop computer. And then I believe somewhere there I might have an external camera plugged in. Uh, I can play back video, I can play back stills, uh, any of that, and I simply click on those images to put them on the air, so to speak. So with something like that on your computer, you can take your laptop computer to a news event and do a multi-camera webcast with numerous sources and show pictures and, and PowerPoint or whatever you want to do. So that's just one more way to kind of put a TV studio on your laptop. We've learned a lot today, and as I said, many of our viewers are dipping our toes, and we do want to take the plunge. So how do we continue to learn more about social media development? I think the key is to follow some people who are really sharp on social media. So they're culling through all of the information that's out there for you. One of the best sites, I think, is Mashable.com. And Mashable has got, uh, every day, they'll have a dozen or maybe even more stories. And then at the, week, the end of the week, they actually do a recap of the top social media stories. So if you review these kinds of stories, you can find out what are the trends, what are people using, what um, is the latest uh, in the social media world that I want to pay attention to. So Mashable is a really good source. I've got another one here for you as well, ProCommunicator.com. This is really a communications site, and this is run by a gentleman in California called uh, Kelly Houston. And Kelly has had high-profile communications positions with uh, on a number of uh, really national uh, uh, police cases and things. So he is very, very well schooled in this and it really does a nice job of pulling information together. Another one in the social media realm we mentioned earlier is Amber, Amber MacArthur. Uh, AmberMac.com is her website and she is on top of a lot of social media. So there's a lot of places but these are some of the better ones where you can get information. How about you? <laughs> if people want to contact you and they'd like to have some consultation, uh, can they contact you? Yeah, as a matter of fact, sure. I've got my uh, phone number there on, this, uh, on the screen and my web email address at carry.sharer at gmail.com and uh, happy to help out. Uh, well, you love this subject and it certainly is on the forefront of health communication. So I want to thank you so much for doing this for I us I do, today. Chris, and I, I, it's been a lot of fun, and I think now we need to go make a video. Oh. <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Please remember to fill out your evaluations online. Your feedback is always helpful to the development of our programs